All right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to my webinar on how to use an oscilloscope to make measurements on an ultrasonic transducer system. Um, my own personal experience with an oscilloscope started in graduate school, actually, because I was a mechanical engineer and we didn't really use oscilloscopes uh, too much. Uh, so that ended up being my first experience and it was a bit confusing at first. Um, it didn't have to be. Uh, mind you, there was nobody teaching me how to use it or showing me, but uh, at that time, um, and but now I'm here to show you what uh, what I maybe would have liked to know all up front. Um, so here's a couple of topics that we're going to go over. We're going to we're going to talk about what you can measure within a oscilloscope. But we, I really want to get practical today. Uh, you know what the what are the different types of probes? How do you attach them? How do you actually set up the measurements, like demonstrating that? Uh, and also uses of math cha math channels and other things that will separate you from like using an oscilloscope like a beginner. Uh, to an expert. Uh, and I'll just mention that we're talking about ultrasonic transducer signals, um, and they range a huge amount. Uh, we may be in our own particular device, uh, but uh, they go all the way from obviously 20 kilohertz to, to several megahertz. Uh, what I'm going to be mostly speaking to are the power ultrasonic people who are working under 100 kilohertz, but the same techniques and methods apply. But whenever you go to higher frequency ranges, you need to have better equipment um, all across the board, better probes, better electrical setup of how those probes are connected, better oscilloscopes. Um, you know, the costly stuff starts being very important. But for folks working under 100 kilohertz, you can, I don't want to say get away, but you can suffice with a lot of basic instruments, which actually aren't quite expensive. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to share all that with you. So what can you measure with an oscilloscope and what does it basically uh, do? And here's an example of an oscilloscope. This is an entry level one uh, that I, one of the ones that I have. Uh, but basically you're, you're after high frequency voltage and current waveforms. You're measuring, you know, voltage is, uh, you know, has some frequency, current has some frequency and you're trying to measure that. Um, it does high speed sampling, for example, one giga sample a second. Um, you know, in general, we know that you you should be sampling at least uh, 10 times uh, the samples per second that you want to measure in frequency. And if it gets like, if you're trying to measure transients, if you're trying to do something with square waves, you're even more, um, you're, you're even more needy of high frequency abilities because you can't measure uh, square waves accurately. Even if the square wave is like, um, a one kilohertz square wave, well, it has many higher frequency components that actually allow you to realize that um, waveform accurately. Um, so sinusoids make it easy, square waves make it hard. That's 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 unfortunately the short of it. Uh, so there, there are multiple channels measured and they're synchronized. So you can do things like phase measurements and also understand how current and voltage, for example, are changing uh, with respect to each other. Um, you can also do analysis on those measured waveforms. For example, you can do the RMS, voltage peak to peak, also frequency measurements and phase measurements. And I'll, I'll be showing all, uh, all of these things. Um, there's also these channels called math channels that you can enable that you use two of the channels, let's say voltage and current. You multiply the voltage channel by the current channel and therefore you get the instantaneous power. You take the DC average of that. Now you actually have the uh, dissipated power um, which is uh, which is drawn actually by the transducer. You can also use an FFT uh, functions on the oscilloscope to analyze the spectral content. And the two conditions that we use oscilloscopes to analyze, so there's two major analysis kind of a set, um, uh, approaches, steady state, where we just want to look at 10 waveforms that are just re keep going back and forth like they're just, uh, you just have 10 waveforms that you want to look at. This is a steady state oscillation if that makes any sense, right? It does make sense. So steady state oscillation, constant low amplitude, and everything's a, everything's pretty stable. Uh, and there's also uh, the transient effect. For example, during the tuning process, um, we can understand what happens to how the tuning happens for the transducer um, with the drive circuit, how that's exactly working. Um, you can also understand, like, let's say you have your transducer and your welding, and that, that process doesn't take too long. You can actually sample, let's say it takes less than a second, half a second for that welding process. You can analyze the waveforms and the current and the power draw throughout that cycle so you can better analyze 
how your driver is performing, what kind of uh, current draw your transducer is requiring, what power draw that's requiring. So all of those analyses can be possible if you have an oscilloscope, which I'm sure uh, most of you do, uh, but perhaps you're looking to refresh your information, gather new ideas or different aspects of this um, you know, very useful uh, test instrument that you may not have been aware of. Uh, so I'm just going to sh change my share. I have a camera set up and I'm going to just, I'm not going to go in detail right now. The detail is going to come later, but just to show what I have in store for you all today. Um, so I have, I'm going to be showing a traditional benchtop oscilloscope. I'm going to be working a lot on the Pico scope or a USB oscilloscope, but this is very easy to share, obviously, in a webinar. I'm going to, I'm going to be showing different, different probes like the current clamp uh, probe. Um, we got, uh, I, I have some resistors. Oh man, I can't find that thing. Um, but basically there, I have some torn up voltage probes that I'm gonna show. Um, and there's this 100X voltage probe. So I'm gonna be showing all these things for you today and uh, actually be doing measurement on a drive circuit I developed. It's actually based off of, uh, it's based off of many of the webinars I've done before and similar ideas. You'll recognize the amp, you'll recognize the Arduino, you'll recognize a, a transformer, uh, things like that. So. Um, when we're going to analyze it today using an oscilloscope just to show both in steady state and transient. And let me go back to the PowerPoint now. Um, so before that, I should tell you about my company, which is one of these slides. I think it should have should have been earlier. Oh, here we are. Um, well, here we go. All right. So again, uh, many of you may know, but some of you may not. And those watching online also need this information because if you're working on an ultrasonic transducer project and this is your first one it may be deceptively simple i found that many of my clients can develop their first working prototype all by themselves um and it's uh, you know the ingenuity of different intelligence or different people um and uh, kind of different ideas however when it gets to the details of making a practical device um making one that's repeatable they struggle and that's where somebody with uh, deep knowledge and experience and uh, ability to utilize multiple different types of tools, such as laser vibrometer, simulations, um, a deep understanding of characterization, data acquisition, a whole bunch of different ideas. That's when a person like that could help, um, like, uh, like people or the person at Ultrasonic Advisors, uh, that's me. Uh, so I'd be happy to speak with you and, and talk over your pro uh, potential uh, uh, project um, or, or in product development course. All right. And let's talk about probes now. Or actually, let's talk about the, we did the oscilloscope. Uh, let's talk about probes. Um, so the, and, and um, I think I, yeah, we're going to talk about probes and the oscilloscope itself, but I'll first start with um, the oscilloscope. And I have one down here. So I think I put it out of order. Um, no worries there. You'll hang along. So there's, I'm just going to jump straight into it. And this is a topic which is kind of pretty important, and interesting to me, is using USB versus bench oscilloscopes. Traditionally, we just had bench oscilloscopes like, like this one here. And everything is getting cheaper. All technology is getting cheaper nowadays. So it's kind of really accessible uh, to all kind of um, different stages of companies. There's a lot of cheaper brands that are still relatively good quality and the original uh, expensive brands are still around. Uh, but so there's USB and bench oscilloscopes. So the, obviously the USB oscilloscope is connected to your computer via USB cable uh, and a bench oscilloscope can exist by itself. It has a screen and it can pretty much provide all of the same uh, functions between both of these um, both of these products, they're both oscilloscopes, they both do the same thing. Uh, but there are a couple of differences I think you should all know. And please ask if you have any other questions or anything else you'd like to hear. Um, so the USB oscilloscope, it's easy to document experiments, like you can take screenshots really easily. It's easy to float, meaning that you uh, don't have to be referenced to ground. If you are working off a laptop and you disconnect the power supply to your laptop, most likely it's not even grounded anyway, but if it if it is grounded, it would not be grounded. So you can choose your ground wherever you want. They're, they're usually cheaper, at least for entry level. At least for entry level. And, and for, for people working under 100 kilohertz frequency, um, that's really all you need. Um, 
more than you need actually. It usually comes with the function generator. So this, for example, has five BNC out, uh, outputs or five BNC connections. One of them is a function generator, which most bench oscilloscopes do not have. Some have, but those are tend to be the very high um, level uh, ones. For the bench oscilloscope, you need dedicated space, but it's really easy to troubleshoot and it's already there and ready kind of to use. Um, it's easy to change settings like knobs and things. It comes with physical a physical interface. So it's easy to press those buttons, and you know we all miss the, the the old days with the old smart the old phones where you get to actually feel the button press. Uh, maybe they're changing that nowadays, but or they're trying to with maybe piezoelectric haptics or something like that. Maybe I don't know. Uh, but uh, basically, um, it's easier to use tactile like physical buttons and stuff. So you can just get really get to the data that you want to see. However, the screen is usually small unless you're going for maybe tens of thousands of dollars and uh, to pay for a uh, for for a larger one which they do tend to be better uh better better scoped out in terms of their specs. Um but I I found that they're usually a huge pain to document the work during during experimentation. Typically what happens is that we insert a USB uh, drive into this port and then we have to go to utility a utility section and like download or upload that document uh, or upload the data whether it's a screenshot or whether it's the raw data and the USB you can either just do print screen right there or you just do file save um, and it'll save all those points and however and you can even keep continue to process the data within the USB pr um, program um, later so I, I'm pretty partial to USB oscilloscopes, but but I do find that sometimes the bench oscilloscopes they just come with better specs, especially the non-entry level ones. Um, so l comparing these two, which I would consider kind of entry level, um, these two oscilloscopes both have four channels. Uh, ones from PicoScope, other ones from Rigol. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive, under under or around five hundred dollars. They're both eight bit. That means there's um. Uh, I want to say, yeah, one, 1,024. I'm pretty sure that's 8 bits, not 256. Uh, so 1,024 uh, levels that every uh, scale is set at. So if your scale at plus or minus 20 millivolts, there's 1,024 levels in between that. So that can be, uh, I think it's 8 bits, man. Somebody correct me. I, I, it's not 256. Anyways, okay. Uh, continuing on. So they're basically discrete, uh, um, they're basically discrete uh, levels that you can measure, and the the higher the bit count, the better the resolution. Um, the, uh, this one, for example, has 200 mega samples per second, limited to one channel. When you enable multiple channels, that that samples per second is now split across the channels. This one has one giga sample per second. So if you let's say enable all of these channels on this oscilloscope, you'll be just as good as the picoscope here. Um, the fun, the cool thing about uh, this, the PicoScope is that it has one mega sample per second USB streaming. So basically, you can take, um, even though I think this uh, this oscilloscope has only 16k points of memory, uh, versus this has 24 mega points of memory. Uh, the difference is that you can stream data to your computer at one mega samples per second. So you don't actually need this unless you are working at a faster sampling rate. Um, but if you were, if you want to work at one mega sample per second or less, you can continue to stream data as long as you want. So imagine like you, you, your whole experiment takes 10 seconds. Um, you can, you can, you can take 10 mega samples in that time. And that can be all stored on your computer. And, uh, and one mega sample is pretty good for measuring like 40, full of 40 kilohertz signals, perhaps not so good for hundred kilohertz, but, um, and the, and the usual power ultrasonic range is pretty good. Uh, but this oscilloscope won't have any such problem. It already has 24 mega sample mega points, so you can spread that out however you'd like to. But you can't stream to a, to a computer, although you can interface through the back. There's a back USB-A port, and uh, through most modern, almost all oscilloscopes you can buy nowadays, regardless of how much they, they cost, um, there will be commands that you can access, um, either download the data through those commands, or you can also, what what is it? Um, you can also access the measurements that are made. So there are ways to use a benchtop oscilloscope like a USB oscilloscope, but it, it's going to need its own power supply. The nice thing about this is it doesn't need its own power supply. Um, 
Um, and that's uh, that's about it. If anyone else has something to share about uh, their experience with each of these and which one they prefer or why, uh, yeah, you can leave it in the chat and I will just kind of read that out loud um, as we go. All right, let's continue quickly. All right, so there are different types of probes. You have to connect to your USB oscilloscope. You have to connect probes, um, voltage, you know, voltage probes and things like that. So uh, those are those are BNC BNC uh, connectors to almost all oscilloscopes. Um, the the higher end oscilloscopes have advanced connections. Along with BNC, they have other types of uh, inter interface connections. Uh, brands like Tektronics and, and Keysight, they have their own own type of probes and own smart connectors that will recognize 10x, but they cost 10x the price for these. Uh, for the oscilloscopes, they cost 10x the price, and for the probes, are 10x the price. I'm not sure if they're 10x the worth, uh, especially for uh, for for the frequency ranges we're really interested in, um, you know, under 1 megahertz typically, or even up to 2 to 3 megahertz. Um, so we have 1x probes, which basically delivers the voltage faithfully to the oscilloscope. Um, there are 10x probes, which drop the voltage down. Like, why would you want to do that? Well, the reason you'd want to drop down the voltage and, and you know, form a voltage divider, divider circuit and drop down the voltage is so you can measure larger voltages. And also, it happens to be, and I'll explain why, that when you do use a 10x probe or a 10x probe setting on a 1 to 10x probe, um, you actually can measure higher frequencies more faithfully due to the higher bandwidth of these probes um, that they distort, um, that they drop all frequencies under their rated bandwidth equally rather than distort higher frequencies more than lower ones. So you can measure, let's say, a square wave very good. You can be sure that you have the proper rise time and you also have the proper final amplitude, for example, of that square wave. And there are current probes. So current is, a, and they use a, you know, ma ma magnet, a ma magnetic uh, induction and they, they create, and they use kind of a, what's called an active probe. So all of these require a battery usually, and they're on the pricier side. Uh, and they can get very, very expensive depending on uh, which brand you get it from and what the specifications are. There are differential probes um, that can measure floating voltages. So you don't have to hook to a common ground. You can have, you know, a voltage uh, measured across any two points. And that will um, that will be sufficient for, for, for getting uh, a reading there. Um, there are 100x probes to even get to larger uh, scales, and this is really important for USB oscilloscopes, which have a limited maximum scale typically. If you go back here, um, so actually this one has a limited scale too, uh, 10 volts per division. Actually, this is not, this should be, if this is, this should be 100 volts. So the, this, uh, the, the picoscope can go to plus or minus 20 volts. The uh, but this benchtop one can go to plus or minus 100. So if you have a 10x probe, this can go to plus or minus 1,000. This can go to plus or minus 200. Usually for ultrasonics, usually we're not going higher than 1,000. So you, so for a benchtop scope, you don't need a 100x probe. For but for a usually for a uh, USB oscilloscopes, they don't go to as high of a range. So you, so 100x probe will get you over 1,000 volts of measurement, which is just uh, which will get you everything you need there. Uh, and, and they can be very, relatively inexpensive, depending on how you decide to purchase it. There are high frequency probes, which I won't get into. Uh, and there are also other types of active probes, which are better for high frequencies, like RF. And um, if, you're, if, you're, if your signals are in several megahertz or even in the gigahertz range um, or close to that, uh, you'll need different stuff. And I probably wouldn't be the, this is not the right webinar for you anyway, then at that point. <laughs> um, so let's compare probes. Like, uh, what's the difference between probes? So this is a six dollar probe, basically two for twelve dollars. This is a no name probe. Um, this is the circuit inside of it to drop the voltage, ten mega ohms and thirteen picofarads. The oscilloscope itself is one mega ohm. Um, so that makes the ten mega ohm to one mega ohm uh, makes the ten to one ratio. Um, well, basically it's a nine. It's a nine inside, but it's 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 um. A total of ten, if you include the oscilloscope, um, and the these specs are the same, and this is a a ten x probe, and the the bandwidths are approximately the same. So you'll see that buying a name brand probe may not really be a good decision um, 
it really depends, uh, and you have to prove it out yourself. Um, but it typically, I, I, you know, you find no issue with using um, not no name no name kind of brand probes, and those are actually the similar probes that ship with uh, a company like PicoScope. They ship with their products like the the no name probes, um, and uh, they works they, they they work well. So I, 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 there's no issue with with and there's no severe complexity in getting to these specifications uh, and the need for extremely high quality. Um, then how about this? So how about a, a 1x probe? So you can use the 10x in the 1x setting. Note that the, the, the bandwidth goes lower uh, and I'll explain why that happens in, in a few moments. Um, uh, but you can also use a BNC to clips that's just a straight wire. That could be a one X probe, right? Um, you know, whatever voltage is at the t at the leads is going to be the one that's sensed at the oscilloscope. Um, this is not. This is a one mega ohm. This would technically be a one mega ohm uh, because it's just it's just accounting for the oscilloscope itself. Uh, I don't know how many. Um, and depending on let's depending on the uh, um, the capacitance, let's say it's a hundred picofarads, it would have. Um, I don't. I just. I don't know what this is exactly. But basically, based on the capacitance and the um, and the uh, and the resistance of the probe, the the bandwidth will go lower or higher. Basically, it will be. It will damp. At, you know, at first approximation, it'll damp higher frequencies, uh, preferentially than lower ones. So it won't be. You won't get a tr good square wave if you're doing lower frequency measurements. If you're doing high frequency work, you'll you'll get damped or an altered signals. Um, so don't use a BNC at Eclipse to measure voltage, basically, uh, because these probes are actually do have components in them, do have design and shielding, uh, and uh, the way to uh, route the conductor, uh, which measures the voltage in a, in a specific way. So use the 1x probe. If you want to use a 1x probe, use a BNC. Use a actual probe, not a BNC to clips. Um, but however, if you want to provide power to something, do not use a 1x probe. You might be thinking, oh, let me just hook up a 1x probe and use that to drive my transducer like less than 10 volts or something. And you have, a... they're, they're not meant to drive current. Um, these BNC to clips have a better ability to drive current. They have thicker conductors um, and, and better better path pathways and design for that. All right, uh, but if you don't have any, if you don't have a one X, it's just not it's not the end of the world to use that. It d just depends on if it's suitable. You may find there's more noise. Um, here's a one hundred and ninety dollar, which is I'm I'm looking I'm I'm giving everything on the cheap side. By the way, uh, you could go for the name brand versions, which are probably two thousand dollars. The same thing, um, a name brand meaning Tektronics or Keysight, uh, something like that. Um. And it provides 10x to 100x uh, differential voltage measurements as a high, relatively higher uh, uh, bandwidth. And the $16 uh, dollar probe, for example, you could also do a 100x probe if you wanted if you wanted to get to that larger range. And it has actually a larger um, it ha it has larger impedance, so you you should actually be able to measure a higher higher bandwidth. I think these are listed as the same, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense given these uh, values. But anyways, um, I think they're just about uh, averaged out. Um, yeah, so this is this is also pretty relatively inexpensive to 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 purchase there. Another another um, like option instead of getting a differential probe, you could use a USB oscilloscope and laptop and float the f um, laptop by disconnecting the power. Uh, therefore you don't need a special probe as long as all of your grounds are common. And the other way to do it, maybe some of you are familiar with this and some of you may not be, uh, but if you connect the ground, if you have two channels, um, channel A and channel B, and if you connect the ground probes of channel A and channel B, um, then you connect the two tips of those probes at the two points you want to measure differentially, you can subtract those two channels and now you'll actually have a differential measurement. Usually you'll have less resolution because you have to have two channels and there may be some type of offset or something, but you can actually do a pseudo differential measurement, not cause any shorting issues by just using two oscilloscope probes and they can both be grounded to the same reference point, either to each other or just to the common ground. All right. Um, 
just for just to show, here's the equivalent circuit of a 10x probe. Um, so we have uh, the voltage divider, nine mega ohms. So the, so the, it says one. You know, the spec sheet says what, 10 mega ohms, but it's actually nine mega ohms. And the oscilloscope always has a one mega ohm input impedance. It doesn't draw much current. And we have a 20 uh, picofarad capacitor here, um, and that might vary. So there is a probe adjustment compensation capacitor, uh, which you should never forget to alter. If you're using the 10x mode on your 1 to 10x probe, never forget to set that. And I'm going to show a demonstration how to compensate that probe um, uh, a little bit. I'm not going to I probably won't actually do it because it might take too much time. I think we're... I don't want to run out of time here, uh, but it will. Uh, but it is necessary for to get a a flat frequency response because when you are when you're in AC, it's not just enough to have a <coughs> excuse me, it's not just enough to have a voltage divider circuit like nine mega ohm to one. You also have to balance the time constants. Um, looking for my water here. Where did I put that? It's huge. Um, uh, uh, so you have to also balance the time constants, which that's why there's a trim cap a trim capacitor to do that and if it looks like hey i could build a circuit myself where you well you could you could build your own 10x probe and if you have a trim cap or even if you use different set resistors of a certain picofarad value um you can build whatever you wanted if you had a not uh, a 99 mega ohm resistor that would get you a hundred, you know, hundred X probe, and but you ha might have have a different trim cap capacitor. Uh, sometimes they're in the base of the base of the. Let's zoom in here. Some, uh, okay. Let's see. Sometimes they're in the base, like this little hole here, that that changes um, the compensation factor, and sometimes they're in the handle itself. Um, they're usually easier to adjust when they're in the base. Okay. Um. Now you can also for for measuring current you can use a current clamp, um, which is nice because you just put the wire th you, you don't have to cut any wires you just uh, open the clamp put the wire in and close it there and then you have then you can measure uh, you know according to these two outputs go to a B and C cable, or you can use a a embedded power resistor and measure it with a voltage probe so that becomes relatively inexpensive. I've also found that they're so much less noisy to use a voltage probe and a resistor. So much less noisy than using a current clamp. Uh, so I would say only use a current clamp if you if you have to because they have known issues that I've seen multiple times like they have a there's there's an offset which always gets exists. They're very sensitive to noise. They're not that high in resolution either. So they are useful in certain circumstances, but they are. But I actually have n I actually have had a current clamp, and I I lost it because I that's how infrequently I used it, and I did find it for use in this uh, this presentation. I'll show, but uh, I actually lost it. That's how little I used it uh, because I just always went for the volt went for the uh, uh, resistor method because it was just it's it's more inexpensive and it's also much more stable. Um, and, so here are some of the recommendations that I that I'm giving for purchases um, in terms of power ultrasonic devices. Um, so the the oscilloscope that I showed, its its information is here. Also the P, the PicoScope USB oscilloscope. I have another one here, uh, a Handtech uh, device uh, USB oscilloscope, which also seems to have good performance. Um, if you want something better than this, what do you look for? I would say look for eight channels and 12 bit resolution if you want something that actually exceeds these because these you know the bandwidth on these on these oscilloscopes and the sampling rate you're not going to need anything better than that for under 100 kilohertz work or maybe even under 200 kilohertz um you're not going to need you're not going to need something much better um but for 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 getting um, you know, just for, for improving your setup, eight channels or a 12 bit uh, 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 oscilloscope would be perfect. Um, and uh, let's see. So, for voltage probes, usually everybody already has many passive 1x, 10x probes. They always come with a, with an, if you're buying an oscilloscope, they'll come with four. You're, you're done. Uh, I would also recommend having a 100x probe for a few reasons. Um, yeah, yeah. So one person said, "How do you set up the current resistor measurement 
uh, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll explain that. I'll make sure to get to that point and remind me if I don't. Uh, but um, so uh, I was mentioning, yeah, so we all, we all have 10X, 1X probes. The 100X probe is also good because it has a 100 mega ohm, um, or, yeah, it was a 100 mega ohm input impedance. Uh, and, and also just as a, just to, just to tell you, you can't use an oscilloscope right off the bat for preload voltage measurement. Uh, because it drains voltage as it measures it, similar to a multimeter. However, if you use the 100x probe, let's see, where's the 100x guy? Uh, and it said it is um, 100 mega ohms total. So if we have 100 mega ohms and we have, let's say, five microfarad capacitor, uh, it'll it'll be like 500 seconds time constant which is per, which is fine so if you use a 100x probe you could actually do a preload measurement but don't do it with a 1x probe because it'll drain too fast um if you're looking for preload uh but how to set that up is another story um power resistors for uh current measurement uh there's also the current probe i suggest having it even though i never used it actually i figured out a good use for it right now so i'm going to show you uh, a differential probe i don't have one at all i've never purchased it because whenever I needed to use differential probes, I just used a USB oscilloscope and floated it with a laptop, or I used two probes and just uh, used the differential method that way. Uh, remember always to compensate probes, um, and I'll explain that, and verify the correct performance by comparing 1x and 10x uh, voltages uh, for a sine wave um, at your desired frequency. So the, the so if you have a 40 kilohertz sine wave should appear almost exactly the same for one x setting and a 10x setting. That's how you know you've compensated correctly. Uh, but you but the the method the official method to compensate is to use a uh, you use a, a square wave at one kilohertz to compensate uh, and and uh, eliminate the ring down uh, and uh, the under I guess the overshoot and the undershoot I guess. Um, but uh, the and a method to to verify that and at least get get it even more accurate for your desired frequency is to compare that at at at, at your desired frequency and you can recompensate if necessary. Um, I also recommend having a dedicated measurement box with a ground side resistor for voltage and current measurement. And I was looking for a picture and I remember that I had it right here. Um, so let me just scroll back down and find this spot. So. This is a kind of a small screenshot of a box. Here's a BNC cable. It goes to a box where there's a res where this uh, a wire goes to the transducer, and when it comes back, there's a there's a uh, resistor, and then it goes to ground. And that way, I can easily hook up these probes and keep everything really neat. Uh, that that makes everything so much easier to use. Um, um, so okay, so there's two, two two questions there. I see on the on the chat. So I will. Uh, I will make sure to get to those. It's end up being a long presentation, uh, but it's almost done. There's only one more left. Um, setting up the oscilloscope, uh, and, and I'll get to your questions right at the end uh, regarding the uh, resistor. Um, how do you set it up? You understand what range you expect to measure. Uh, so if you want 100 volts peak to peak, you at least double the range, and similar thing with the current. Uh, and I'm talking through things pretty fast, so but I'll be sending out this uh, presentation. Uh, and you also do the same thing with current, whether if you have resistor measurement um, or you have a uh, current clamp. Uh, and there are two types of measurements. So steady state, you can adjust the time base to capture the time it takes for 10 cycles. Um, you'll be seeing on the screen and the triggers and everything. Um, and there, there are many uh, probably YouTube tutorials. Um, you know, this is not a webinar just to go tell you to watch other YouTube tutorials, but um, there are some to help you perhaps with the details of the oscilloscope that I may not have time for today. And there's also transient measurements that you can actually capture several seconds, like I mentioned. With the PicoScope, you could do one mega sample per second streaming. Um, you don't have to worry about that issue with the Benchtop one, though, because it has enough memory. Uh, but important to ensure your sam maximum sample rate and maximum number of si samples are recorded. That setting has to be changed manually on a USB oscilloscope. Um, I think it's automatic, almost usually automatically done on a bench top one but you should make sure and the skill scope will tell you how many samples per second it is taking 
like right now I have the bench shop one running just uh it's a 50 second capture and it's 40 kilo samples per second 24 mega 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 points or mega sample mega points per sa per second 24 mega points per second well, that doesn't really equate but anyways uh there's a lot of points and you have to you have to make it uh m ensure that you're measuring enough to capture the frequencies you're interested in or you're just going to get noise uh or something that looks like noise here are some of the measurement setup parameters um so f if you're using a resistor for current measurement you may need to set up a math channel to redo your voltage measurement because you have voltage drop over your resistor. So channel A minus channel B equals the voltage over the transducer only. Uh, and I didn't draw a circuit for that, so I might as well do that now. Um, and I may actually pause the record. Actually, I won't pause the recording. I'll just, so uh, let's see. Oh, this is the wrong one, alas. Um, my, <laughs> my, my tablet went to the wrong screen. That's all right, I can just draw it by hand, not like my handwriting is much better. Um, but OK, so you have your transducer. You have a resistor, and you have a ground. And you have your, you probably think I'm, I'm I was always drawing with the mouse. I wasn't. Uh, and if this is, if this is 10 ohms, then uh, one milli volt is equal to uh, 0 0.1 milli amp. Just virtue, you know, V equals I R basically. V equals I R. Um, so that's how you, and if you measure voltage here and voltage there, um, this is channel A. And this is channel B. This is the resistor method. Uh, if your voltage drop, I just I made a claim. You know, if your voltage drop is less than five percent over your resistor, like if you if your impedance ends up being one hundred one hundred ohms, yeah, you want to do channel A minus channel B to get the voltage. But if it's a thousand ohms, this is very small uh, compared to a thousand, so you can just ignore it. Uh, you could ignore the voltage drop and just say all of channel A is basically the voltage of the transducer. Uh, and there's one other question. So the the other question is, do do you need a preamp to enhance the signal? Typically, I don't. I, typically, you don't need a preamp. Uh, that's really not something I've seen. I've I haven't used one myself. In terms of current, you know, the only issue, the only problem you would ever have is measuring current that's too low. Uh, in that case, I would use a larger resistor. Uh, in a 1x probe there's i haven't seen per se differential probes or active probes that increase the voltage um that's just me uh that's just my experience if you wanted better resolution i would say use a 12-bit oscilloscope and or use a uh use a bench top oscilloscope which has which has a better smaller lower range so usually i've i've, I've seen this a lot bench top oscilloscopes here this the the usb one has plus or minus 20 volts as the lowest range this has plus or minus five millivolts so it's five times better four times better uh and also if you try to increase the uh, bit count that'll help you measure your smaller smaller current but usually you don't have ever you don't usually don't have trouble ever measuring voltage it's always in the volts range or tens of volts or hundreds of volts even um and there's another question if some if i utilize a 10x probe setting and setting a horizontal line to 500 millivolts should i correct the copy to oscilloscope data dividing it by 10 um, so you should be able to set that oscilloscope setting to a 10x probe. Both the benchtop and the uh, USB oscilloscopes all have those functions that you can change the probe type. There are even like current probes. So for this, you could put this in the, the thing. You would put what's the unit? Amps. What's the ratio? 1 to 10. Not 10 to 1. You'd say, you set a 1 to 10 ratio. Then you get this. Um that's so you can actually set you can actually set this up and sorry this is channel b anyways you can set this up like this um i probably won't have time for the demonstration here uh but uh but i can you know i'll i'll just i'll just maybe just sh show it 
because I already kind of have it set up. But um, w w what do you guys think? Sh sh should I just show the uh, do the demonstration part or kind of just kind of cut it short right now? Uh, doesn't the resistor steal power from the transducer or affect the resonant point? Yeah, it it does all if it drops a lot of voltage. So if your if your transducer is one thousand ohms, and your resistor measurement is ten, is your resistor is ten ohms? No, it's not taking any. It's like it's taking one percent. However, if it is more, then it is. You know, if you have a ten ohm and a hundred ohm, like I'm, I'm going to be showing. Yes, you should probably subtract them. Um, uh, so for the demonstration, do you want to see me set up the, I, 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 it's so much easier to do demonstrations on the USB oscilloscope, but I did want to show maybe the benchtop one. Do you want to see the benchtop or, uh, at all that might make it kind of too long. Um, so what if you're using 50 ohm transducer? Yeah. Then you can use a one ohm device, or you can use that channel a minus channel B to get the voltage then you're, then you're okay. Um, yeah, I think I could show the bench a little bit. I, I'm I, I'm not a huge fan of the bench, by the way, but I think it's I think you have to know it. You don't want to show up someplace and like somebody gives you a bench top oscilloscope. You're like, what what do I do with this thing? And the and the and the all the concepts go back and forth really. Um, so sometimes what you have available, and also sometimes for the reasons of performance, because higher performance bench top oscilloscopes are cheaper than the USB ones. Or you just don't want to have a laptop around um, because you get distracted. Yeah. So so yeah, I, I still need to get to the auto data capture part. Like, how do you capture data from an oscilloscope, uh, especially a benchtop one, because those are much more common in practice. Uh, but I also mentioned that uh, the desktop ones can be calibrated uh, to the standards necessary for medical devices, so they actually are useful. And I have actually, I want to say, I yeah, yeah, I have actually implemented at, at, at one company that I, I worked for at something like that. I worked for a medical surgical device. We had implemented a picoscope um, and it was at a large company and it was it was calibrated and everyone, the quality folks were fine with it. So uh, hopefully that'll be uh, that'll be the case for whatever other project. But l let me get to the let me share the video okay share advanced content from second camera okay i don't want to get too long but all right can you see that second camera this is actually an iphone so it's kind of cool i can do this all right you guys see the oscilloscope and i'm going to move my head out of the way actually i might even stop sharing my head uh Okay, you, everything's seen fine. Okay, so mind you, just turn it on. And uh, I'm going to use this probe here. But is it connected? Uh, this one's not connected, so I'll use it. They get kind of hairy. I wish they made like short oscilloscope probes. That would be that would be an invention uh, that I would be very interested in, actually. Um, Okay. All right. So oscilloscope probe. You they, they come with different tips and stuff. Great. Um, I plug this in, and then I. Um, then there's this little thing over on the side. I want to show you because you have to compensate the probe, so that do not use without you know friends don't let friends use 10x probes without compensating them so you stick your uh, one side on the top and the other ground thing on the bottom and right now right now the probe is in it's in the 1x mode but that's okay i'm just going to press the auto set now i press this auto auto button this is like the cheat the, the, the cheat way and then it then it shows a square wave so that's a one kilohertz square wave it's meant to uh help you calibrate because if the square wave is perfect uh we have um we have good frequency response across the board and now i always use lose my screwdrivers so there's a, there's in, in the base of the all right come on zoom in for me all right there you go okay don't do that so the, in the base there's like this uh um 
trim cap basically. So you twist that and it can change this. But right now we're doing a 10x probe. So I changed it to 10x and obviously the voltage got lower. I'm just gonna press the auto button again. And obviously, the, so if you see, this is no longer a good square wave. It's like, um, it's, you know, it's sad. It didn't, it, you know, it, it's slow moving. It doesn't have any, didn't get its coffee in the morning, I guess you could say. Um, so in order to pep it up a little bit, because, you know, no sad square waves here. Um, I think this, okay, there we go. Is it changing it? Not quite. Uh, it's stuck. Oh, that's better. Not perfect. Um, but you can only get so good, really. So you can you can actually zoom in a bit to see how you're doing. So this is zooming in and um, changing that. And in the corner, you'll actually see it says one giga sample. So one giga sample per second, 24 mega points and over five microseconds. So that information is important for you when you're actually doing the other measurements. But this seems pretty good. It doesn't have it doesn't react too slowly. Let's let's continue to change it. Um, oh, that's I guess too much here. This is for the height. The the height. Uh, I think I think sometimes this is better to use a broader view. This is for the time. Uh, basically, that's that's okay, I guess. Oh. Yeah, that's about as good as I'm going to do. So there, that, that probe is now ca calibrated or compensated. It's not really calibrated. Compensated for the square wave output. Um, so what else would I like to show here? Um, I, yeah, I kind of have it hard, harder to, yeah, I can, I can set it up. I can do one of the channels. Um, actually, I'll just do everything with the square wave here, and then I'll kind of jump to the other desktop one. I don't think I'll have time for too many questions today, unfortunately. Um, so to do to change the the capture time, um, you just change. You just actually I'll zoom out. This is to alter the time base, so you collect more or less time. Um, you usually want if you're doing steady state, you usually kind of want ten seconds. Um, if you want to measure, you press measure. And you see the channel source is one, and you can do like period frequent, like we'll do we'll do frequency, and it's hard to read is another kind of issue there. It's one kilohertz as you see in the corner. Maybe you can't read it yet. Um, and then you can do like uh, I can scroll down and get to voltage RMS. That's usually a typical one, uh, and it's already there, so it's 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 not displaying it. So it's two hundred nine millivolts voltage RMS. Um, if you start enabling, so you see, you'll see right now, it's 500 mega samples per second. If I enable channel two, now it's 250 and 12 mega points. And channel three, it's like less and less. It's less and less points um, every time I enable a channel. Um, Although it says the same samples per second, I guess it's it's, but it's spread across all the channels. Um, so that's how many that's how many points it has per uh, per channel there. Or I guess it's using less. It's maybe it's changing the changing the amount of time by itself. Um, so those are and there's also math channels and all of these are similar between the USB oscilloscope and the uh, and the picoscope. So is there equivalent calibration routine for the picoscope? Yes, absolutely, because it has a input impedance and it has a uh, it has a what do you call uh in input capacitance that you have to balance so you got to balance the capacitor all, because the resistors are very uh, consistent in terms of what they're defined as their one mega ohm but the capacitors have to be calibrated for for the probes and stuff so right now i'll set up i'll turn this off and i'm going to show the circuit and how i i'm going to probe it for a Good ultrasonic measurement, and let's go down. Whoops. Okay. All right. So this is the circuit. A little bit prototype looking, perhaps better than what I've had before. Um, and I'm gonna move it so you can see it. 
Um, hopefully not destroy anything in the process. So this is where the transducer normally sits. I just put a resistor here. This is the resistor that goes to ground. That's the transformer. Don't worry about that. This is the resistor that goes to ground. This is all the drive circuitry that controls amplitude and other things. And this is the power for the amplifier. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the current clamp, measure, and there's an arrow here. If you're going to see, there's an arrow that has to point toward the direction you're measuring. So I'm going to have that there. So it's on. OK. And depending on where you, how you click, it's going to be different. Uh, it's going to go to a different range. How, how you click this current probe. So I've touched the current probe going in. Um, that's on channel D. That's on, the, uh, actually, I can zoom out. What am I doing? That's on, this This is on the fourth channel. On the third channel is where I, uh, where I had this. I'm just probably just going to work in the 1x setting for all of these. So for the picoscope, you can run the arbitrary wave generator at one kilohertz square wave in order to do that same thing. So this is the input to the amplifier, the, the voltage. So this is going to be 12 volts. If I just click it, hold it there, this should be 12 volts DC. Um, and then I'm going to just put that there as another ground. All the grounds are connected in my circuit anyway. <sighs> um, and then it's and then this is voltage. Channel A is actually voltage over the transducer. In this case, it's going to be the resistor. Um, you don't have to really connect all the grounds if they're already connected, but it helps to reduce noise and get you better phase. But it's not actually always useful. So I would say try it yourself before going through the hassle and a little bit messiness of having all of these ground probes connected. Although not everybody's doing a webinar on it. OK. But sometimes it is important. And I want to. Uh, and this 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 is the resistor. So I'm going to put a voltage probe over that. That's going to be my current measurement. OK. Um, and that's all connected. I think I can. Um, and this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to uh, connect my DC power supply, which is under my feet. Um, I'm going to connect the DC power supply. All right, no smoke. Anything hot? No. <laughs> OK. Um, and then uh, we are going to connect this Arduino, which then is going to just start its own program. And it's a kind of funny program, but OK. I think I'm I think I'm done. So channel A, voltage over the transducer. Channel B, uh voltage over the ground side resistor, which is measuring current over the AC current over the transducer. Channel C, uh DC voltage input measurement to the amplifier. Channel D, current measurement to the amplifier. Channel A times channel B would normally be in power going to the transducer. The average power is the power dissipated over the resistor transducer. However, you should do channel A minus channel B because this is a 100 ohm resistor and a 10 ohm ground side. So you're not really going to have, you have too much drop to ignore. You can also subtract the drop later, but in different ways, but I, it's easier just to get take care of up front. And here's channel C and D. So channel C multiplied by channel D is going to be the, and the average of that is going to be the current, uh, the, the power input. Uh, so with that all, squared away, I'm going to share the picoscope screen here. All right, so do you see the picoscope screen? And I can set it up from scratch, basically. Um, do you see, okay, so there we go, so good, yeah. Yeah, I was actually just describing the picoscope. Uh, I was pointing at the picoscope channels. Okay, so I'm going to load the factory default setting, load the factory settings. So this is a, the kind of the funny part of my device. When I don't have it enabled, it just goes between 4 kilohertz and 20 kilohertz. So first, I'm just going to enable all the channels, because they should be all there. Yet, so um, the next thing I'll do is I'll set up channels one by one. So channel A was voltage over the transducer. It was set up as a 1x. I don't have to change it. I, I could, but I, I don't need to. Um, 
channel B is actually oh, a 10 to 1, a 1 to 10 probe of current. So I have to create a new probe. Um, and there's a way to do that. That's it. Create, okay, new probe. And I'm going to use amps um, 0 0.1. So this is a 10 ohm current probe. Okay, and uh, that's great. I'll, it's, it's not selected by default, even if you do add it. So I just add the 10 ohm current probe. So you see now this is in current, the range is in current. And the nice thing about the picoscope, it does this auto feature. It selects the range that's best for you, but it's kind of, as you can see, a bit annoying because <laughs> it keeps going up and down. But that's fine. Um, we're all we're all good with annoying here. Uh, so channel C is going to be 12 volts DC. So there's no need to actually change that current. And channel D right now it is what's good setting for that. Um, yeah, right now I have it at 400. There's a setting here. It says one millivolt per milliamp. So it's one to one. So we're good at one to one, but it's not current basically right now. But I, uh, and I don't know which one of these goes with current. So I can back calculate. So just 20 millivolts. So if I do the right current probe, I should do 20. It should also be 20 at the bottom. No. Um, okay. You know, that's PSI. So I, I, I I'm just not going to change it for our, our argument's sake. I'm just going to leave it at that. And it's not, it's going to be confused when I do math channels. Um, so I'm still here, as you can see. Um, so I will now start to, and, and if I press the button here, like there's a button on my thing to start the program, it goes to that 40 kilohertz point that's trying to find the resonance. So I'm going to stop this right now because it's not fun to look at. I'm going to start adding measurements. So ACRMS, I'm not going to do the math channel thing, sorry. And B, so this is current, this is voltage. Uh, and then I'm going to add a channel. I'm going to add a math channel uh, A times B, or in this thing, you could do A minus B times B if you wanted to do that, uh, something like that. But you'd have to multiply current and stuff. So yeah, somebody said they switched to the Pico sev PicoScope 7. Yeah, I guess the same same steps apply, I guess. Yeah, I have to do that sometimes. So channel A times B, and you do the DC average. This is power. This will give you, it should have given me a unit of power. Um, it didn't. I'm not going to, I probably will if I start it. Nope. Oh, I uh, know I have to do something probably. Probably have to edit it to make it work. Anyways, that's it should have ended up being power. So then you can also do the measurement of channel C. You don't do ACR mass of channel C. That's kind of does make sense because it's a DC signal, 11.96. And then you add a channel D RMS. Actually, you don't need to do RMS either. You should do DC average because it should be. And it has an AC component to it, as you can see, the golden. But we don't much care for the that. We do add a math channel uh, that I've already done, channel C times D. So you can create a channel and do C times D, C times D. I've already done that, so I'm not going to do it again. And then I can do a measurement uh, there. And I can do the DC average. So it's 3.2 watts in and 83 milliwatts out. That's what this is saying. This is in this case, and let's run it. So I'm going to do the, and you can also do. Sorry, the other 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 really relevant thing is you just take channel A and you do frequency. That's usually a pretty relevant thing. So you can tell it's going between four and twenty kilohertz. It's kind of okay. Now I'm just now it's actually doing this resonance tracking of a resistor. Now I'll just stop it, and um, at this point, at this higher frequency, it's four watts in, 0.2 watts out. Uh, at 38.34 kilohertz, and these are all the values. Um, 
but now I want to do one last thing before I have to sign off. Yeah, somebody's um and I, I'm I'm gonna do a uh so if you go to tools, this is important for the PicoScope to do tools, just like the info, view properties. So this shows I I I got this is a sampling rate in the corner. It's kind of small for you, maybe. And this is 11,000 samples. Um, so I'm going to make sure I max out on the samples that it collects. I, don't know, I think 50 is a max that it shows. And I, I want to collect over seconds. Uh, so if I just do start, and then I'm going to start my program right now. And it's collecting at 500 kilo samples per sec per per cycle actually i'll just do one so it's now collecting at one mega sample per second almost oh it went out out of range you get if, for if you do these higher values you probably ought to uh something got out of range where's the red oh it's small okay so Basically, what I'm doing, I'm going to press the button, and that's when this all—that's when the ultrasonics kind of like start. Right now, otherwise, it's just kind of random. So you can analyze this transient effects, basically. Oops, I should have stopped it. If you do a trigger, which I should have done, so I can do trigger, uh, single, and I want to put the trigger up here, and right there. So then if I press the button, it'll trigger and I can just let go. And then I can stop and we can go ahead and we can analyze what's going on here. Um, we can analyze the point where I turned on the all. See, this is this is the this is the, this is the twenty. This is the. 4 kilohertz and this is the 20 this is something random i'm doing in the program it just to, it, it makes a beeping sound so you kind of know everything's connected and here's the instant when i turn on the ultrasonic uh this went to 40 kilohertz um and you can see the current kind of it's a bit oscillating um and uh obviously it's a resistor so it's not really freak it's not really phase tracking or anything it's just doing a little bit of a random deal it probably didn't change frequency much you, uh, mind you, you can also change the to measure the graph between the rulers. So you can stick some rulers in here, and you can measure this initial part. Um, and it's more, uh, and you can track frequency across this. Um, the other nice thing about I'm gonna I'm gonna stop in one second. You could do a spectrum analysis, but I'll I'll save that for another time. So with that, I will. Uh, uh just share my powerpoint again and i want to thank everybody for coming it was a bit of a longer session uh and we had a couple of people uh uh yeah so it's good and you can save those files and the data you know a lot of times engineers work on the bench all day long and they don't have anything to show at the end Be one reason it's hard to save data from an oscilloscope you have to write it down even by hand you can't even the print screen has been my savior print screen paste it in the uh uh paste it in a powerpoint file and just keep on moving like that so so yeah thank you all for 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 joining the uh presentation